Um, I now have to launch this uh, uh, book of magic, um, which uh, has got um, at least my version of some of the answers to the questions that the minister asked. And I just wanted to take you through little bits of it without reading it out to you, because I'm sure you'll all be reading it all night tonight. Um, the, uh, this document arose uh, initially about a year ago when I, I'd been in this job for a couple of years, and I was looking at, at how we might actually begin to bring some coherence to Australian science effort. As I mentioned earlier, starting with education and working all the way through, uh, because without any one element in it, um, then we falter. And we've tended over decades now to pick out individual components, individual elements, uh, do bits at the margin, introduce um, um, terminating grants and, and offsets and the like, which in many respects are not consistent with the strategic approach to this, if we want to be serious about it. So I, um, in, in, in a year, or nearly two years of getting lectured by a whole host of people, Minister, the, uh, I'd come to a number of conclusions. Um, one was that um, if we are going to facilitate uh, our ambitions for Australia, we're going to have to do things in ways, different ways, um, do things quite differently, but particularly on a scale that we hadn't uh, achieved before. And we've, we've become quite good, I think, at breaking things up into small components and, uh, and then presuming somehow that they will cohere. And when you look at it, some do. And there are some really good examples of these programs that work particularly well. So I don't want to leave behind the impression that I think nothing works, because clearly a lot does. But the real issue is, um, are we operating on a scale? So I talk about science teaching in schools and I get told about a program. It's a good program, it's an effective program, but it's about 60 people. And, and the issue for us is, do we say, well, we've got a good program, it's clearly working well, so now let's build it up to get 6,000 people, or we're content with having a good program that touches 60 people in a, in a small number of schools. So it's that scale issue that I think becomes important for us. And of course, that then figures on the spread issue. Uh, we couldn't scale up everything we do because we are actually quite widely spread. The question is, are we too thinly spread? I think the answer to that is yes. So that does come back to actually working out what we need to do, both in basic research and the applications and all the rest of it, but what we need to do where we have some advantages, competitive advantages, as the Minister mentioned, other advantages, and particular a national need. Um, and I think that we need to be more um, focused on some of that um, and get ourselves um, uh, positioned to a place where we can focus and we can scale. Uh, it was also pretty clear, and I guess I'd always known it, but it became clearer over time that science drives growth. There are, there are lots of uh, erudite academic works from uh, economists about how uh, the contribution um, of, uh, or how much of the growth is uh, contributed by science and technology, uh, particularly in places like the United States where they have no doubt about the, the combination. And, and I guess the striking thing for me was the preoccupation, pretty well universal preoccupation with um, science overseas. So in most of the other countries that, uh, that we know and, and would respect and, 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 and are similar to ours, then they have that preoccupation with science in a way uh, that we've not. And I think the minister um, uh, was right when he said that we've lost it in the community. And of course, if we want politicians to listen to us, um, we've got to, we're going to have to do it both by talking to them, but also through the community, because it's the... Uh, communities that um, basically elect them. So um, it, it's important that we get that message across that right. And of course there's also the view in many countries that science is part of the critical infrastructure. There's a preoccupation with that. I think that makes sense and we could do well to share it. So I would beg the question, are we doing the right things to prepare Australia for the future? And we, are we confident that we're doing enough? So I'm not so sure right now. Um, I think our top researchers, and we will publish a report fairly soon which will uh, summarise a lot of the information that's spread around, but our top researchers are very good. We do very well when we look at the, um, at the top end of our research um, uh, output and citations and the like, but we do need to recognise that, that our average is middling. So in essence, we, are, we have room to improve, let me put it that way. Uh, we could be better, we ought to be better. 
uh, our patenting rates are poor and linkages between science and industry are worse and, and uh, as the Minister said, they're probably the worst in the, certainly in the OECD. Um, business uh, often reports difficulty in recruiting science trained graduates. Schools report difficulty getting students to take senior science and advanced maths and it's all linked. I mean, I've sat through at least two meetings where um, I, I, I'm told about how when universities drop prerequisites for maths in courses, as we discussed earlier, that all of a sudden the interest, I mean, why do something that is perceived to be hard if there's no reward for doing it, flits through the mind of a 15 or 16 year old student. And, um, and, and so the universities have a direct connection to the way in which students perceive and study courses at school. And, and we, can't, we can't separate them, but we have separated them. And it's that separation that gets in the way of doing things sensibly and doing sensible things. Um, a mere two in three businesses now identify themselves as innovators. I mean, how can it be uh, that in a country where we've talked about being an economy in transition for nearly as long as I can remember, which might only be yesterday, but at least um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's in reality a fair while, and, and two in, two in uh, five are innovators, but we've had innovation strategies for as long as I can remember, going back 30 odd years, tax incentives, all these sorts of things to try to get more innovation. And yet two in five recognises innovators. 4% of our large companies and about 4% of our SMEs interact with universities where the bulk of our researchers are. And, uh, and, and, and things are not working. And when you look around the world, you see many places where things are working better. Uh, there's a patience in it, there's a persistence in it, they're prepared to invest for the long term and the long run. Um, but they also acknowledge that there are more deficits than just a budget deficit that has to be handled uh, when we think about the future and the country that we want to hand on. So I think we've got a problem, and, uh, and it's a problem that markets and wishful thinking are not going to solve for us. Uh, there are people around who think that markets solve everything. Uh, uh, in this particular area, I don't think they do. I won't comment on other areas because I'm not familiar enough with, but I could extrapolate. Um, but, uh, but I won't. But I don't, I don't think that we should just think it will sort itself out. So, as I've uh, said before in the earlier part, we're not been idle. There's no shortage of programs and papers and clever people with big ideas. But what we actually lack is the coherence that looks at it as a whole. Um, where, where we sit back and say, if we want to make this better, if we have a high aspiration for Australia, if we do all that, and STEM and science is at the core, how do we make them all come together to cohere, to work in the nation's interest? And that means talking to each other in ways we never have. Um, John Rice mentioned earlier about how hard it is to get the scientists in universities to talk to the people in education. It's very hard to get the people in education uh, not to say they won't teach the science we want, so we will teach the education to the pre-service students um, and, and whatever else it is, it won't be science that's at the cutting edge that will, will be of science of the type uh, in the faculties and, um, and uh, schools of science in the various universities, certainly not uh, on average, it won't be like that. So, so these are little cultural issues which we've just got to be willing to get out of the way. Uh, we can continue to muddle along. We can continue to say it used to be good in 1970, so it probably will be again sometime, or 1980 or 1990. We can say all that. And then we can look backwards and say, but nothing's changed. So shifting from incrementalist, self-protective protective denialism um, and self-delusion mm -hmm. is not actually the way for Australia to build uh, a, a sensible future it's for itself. So it was that sort of thinking that has been captured in the very few pages in this book. And um, uh, we are hoping that this will trigger a sensible debate. I would like, of course, if I had a magic wand for the government to stand up and say everything in here is so brilliantly conceived we will implement it entirely tomorrow. Um, I'm not actually anticipating that that will happen. Um, but what it will do is it will certainly trigger a sensible discussion about some of the core elements in this bringing things together, getting some coherence, having conversations we have, have never had, and, and at its core trying to build a scale that will make a big difference to the way this country is performing in 2020, 2025, 30, 35 and beyond. Because if we want it to change then, we've got to start 
we're, we're back at our bowling mark right now and we're starting the run in. And, uh, and we've just got to accept the fact, and also that we will invest and there won't always be an immediate return on that investment. I was reminded of an article the other day about BHP booking losses when it was investing in its new mines and uh, now they're turning a profit, but nobody thought they were stupid to book losses back in the day um, when uh, they were making their investment. They're getting the return on that investment now and this is part of the message that we have to give. It's a long haul, it's a long run, there will be some costs up front, but the cost of doing nothing, which is not frequently a question that the economists seem to ask themselves, you know, is it cost effective? That's one thing. What is the cost of doing nothing sometimes? Sometimes things have a value that is beyond cost, and we need to make sure that we get that message out there too as scientists. Anyway, in this um, uh, recipe book, I've, um, um, we've, we've identified four principal fields for action. We're talking about Australian competitiveness, of course, because that's essentially, um, you know, there is an end game. What is the end game here? One of the things that we've got to do, again, that we've not been particularly good at is think of why we do these things. What's it all for? I mean, you can think of means. We all know it's means. When I was doing research, I thought that was, you know, the best thing in the world and that was the end game. But in fact, the end game was that we were trying to make our contribution to making something better, either by knowing more, using something better, doing something more, whatever it was. But in this instance, I think that what we are hoping to do is to build a stronger and better Australia so that when we hand it on, we'll hand on something that we would be happy to live in. Not just something we say, well, we're going to pass off now so you can have this, and away it goes. So um, we looked at our four fields, Australian competitiveness, how do we make that better, how do we get things working more cohesively, how do we get the researchers and the businesses working together, and they've all got skin in the game. The, the universities are going to have to look at how they promote people, how they reward people, all of those sorts of things, on a scale, because there's some good examples now of what they do, but we need to elaborate on that and, um, and how we get benefits uh, and opportunities that will follow for all people in Australia, wherever they may live and whatever the circumstances of their birth indeed. Education, well, I think uh, Australian education, formal and informal, uh, will prepare a skilled and dynamic STEM workforce that will give us the foundations for lifelong literacy in STEM in the community. I think. As the Minister said, when you lose the community, you lose a lot more than just the people. You lose the capacity to influence, the capacity to encourage, the capacity to grow, um, and indeed the capacity to influence um, uh, the politicians who ultimately, when they're choosing between priorities, will hear what the community is saying to them. And if science is low down, why would they artificially inflate it just because we talk to them. So we've got to work across the whole and we've got to have a community that's ready and willing and well informed and not patronised to and not talked to in language that they can't uh, find accessible because they are not themselves uh, scientists. In research, we've got to contribute new knowledge, we say, to a world that relies on that continuous flow of new ideas and we've got to be willing to apply some of them. And when we talk about the continuous flow of new ideas, um, we need to acknowledge, and as the Minister said, that, that this is an important element and not all of those new ideas will turn into a product or service that generates money. But as a consequence of having them, we will know more. We will understand more. We will think about our planet differently. We'll think about our people differently. We'll think about our communities and societies differently. And all of that is critically important rock on which we can build um, a better Australia. And finally, the fourth plank in this is international engagement. We need to remember a couple of things about Australia. Somebody mentioned that we were small. I think Peter mentioned we were a small population. That's true, we are. Um, we also need to remember that we produced our first PhD graduate in 1948, uh, homegrown PhD graduate. So we're relatively new at this game. But what that actually meant, which we can now benefit from, is that we are we have always been internationally engaged in Australian research and science. We needed to be prior to 1948. After that, of course, it grew um, substantially. But we still need to be, because we're relatively small. Uh, but we need to be doing things ourselves. I can't imagine that anybody in Arizona would be working on uh, the Murray-Darling system. Um, I can't imagine they'd be looking at the Great Artesian Basin. But we can work with them because they'll be looking at their water basins and we'll be looking at ours and there's a complementary skill set that will add up to more than the sum of the parts. 
and international engagement for us, I think, is a critically important part of our future, and we also make some recommendations about that and how to go about that in, in, uh, as well. So I think, um, colleagues, I hope you take the book, have a look at the book, think it's really good, tell every politician you meet that it's great um, and that they should implement it right down to the last full stop or, or even the parts you like. Um, but uh, uh, the, uh, it, it is with pleasure that I actually release this today. It's the culmination of a good year and a half's work, thinking, talking. One journalist uh, who accused me of the uh, ultimate sin of consistency um, uh, accused me of having given 700 speeches on this topic. Uh, it wouldn't be quite 700, but it would be quite a few. So there are a lot of people who have had input into it. We've floated it with a whole lot of people outside. And I would say from the general, the general scientific and indeed elements of the business community, and, uh, uh, many points have quite substantial support. So I think it's a good foundation from which to start and uh, carry on our discussions, Minister, and hopefully um, we can see ways in which we can sensibly bring it all together. Australian science will prosper, and when it does, Australia will too. So thank you.